Okay, the recording has to just has just come on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we will get started uh, in our class today. Okay, who would like to just say a word of prayer for us together? Go ahead, Prince, please. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Now, as I go into start the class, Lord, help us to understand that your word. Give us the good understanding that uh, we'll receive from your word and uh, work forward, Lord. Help us. And also, I pray that you are with us and Holy Spirit, help us to grow in you, Lord. Thank you. And I submit this class in your hand. That in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Prince. All right. So we, um, yesterday, we started talking about the spiritual dynamics, uh, understanding the spiritual dynamics of uh, urban centers, of cities, and so on. So today we will just uh, continue uh, from where we paused yesterday and uh, go forward from there. I'm just going to share my uh, PDF. And um, so what we're saying is that God is at work. So we must understand the natural dynamics. We must also understand the spiritually. Spiritually, what is happening? So we say God is at work in the cities, but at the same time, there are demons. There are Satan and his demons acting in the city. We are also at work in the city. And uh, we went through Revelation chapter 2, where uh, we saw, you know, in, in, in these cities, what four of them, four, four of the cities where Jesus is, when he's speaking to the church, he is also addressing what Satan is doing or what Satan is attempting to do uh, against the church in that city, uh, which is very important because. Uh, you know, the Lord is taking time to address that. And so we also, as believers, must be aware. What is Satan doing in the city and how do we counter those things? Okay. So there is a, a, a let me just make sure I let people live in. I don't want anybody to help. Okay. Okay. Conan. Yeah. Berlin. Okay. All right. So going back to, so we don't want you know, um, uh, to be ignorant of what what Satan and his demons are doing in the city. And we must always keep in mind that the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. So while we are doing things in the natural, uh, understanding the natural dynamics of the city, which will help us in uh, the kinds of ministries we will start, uh, we must also be aware of the spiritual side because that is also going to influence, uh, you know, uh, how we counter what Satan is doing in the city, right? Um, so that's what we're trying to put together here. Now, um, in addition to what we already saw from Revelation chapter two and three, uh, we also see in scripture, and I've just given two references here, that uh, spiritual beings influence natural leaders, influence leaders over cities. You know, that means um, uh, while we are thinking, you know, that, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, the leaders are there and they're doing things, we must also, we must not forget that, uh, let me just, I'm just looking at, uh, looking for a verse here. Um, Yeah, um, uh, we must not forget that there, there is demonic influence over cities and these demonic influence also, demons also influence leaders over cities. So we see that in the example of Babylon and I've given you references here and also over the city of Tyre. And I think one classic example is uh, in First Chronicles 21, verse 1. Can somebody read this, please? First Chronicles 21, 
verse one. It's not on the in the in the notes. That's why I kind of just turned to it in my Bible. Uh, can somebody turn it, to it in their Bibles and read it? First Chronicles twenty one, one. Can somebody read that for us? Now Satan. Now Satan against Israel and moved David to number of number Israel. So David, mm. one is enough. First. Yeah, verse one. So it's look at look at that verse. Second Chronic, uh, First Chronicles twenty one, verse one. It says, Satan stood up against Israel. So Satan was going to go after this nation, Israel. What did he do? He moved on David. He moved on David. Who was David king? He was a leader. And he moved David to do something God had told him not to do. So God had already given clear instruction. The leader must not number harm the nation of Israel. Just trust God that the people will be as numerous as the stars and the sky and the sand and the seashore. You don't worry about numbering the people. And so here, yeah, it's telling Satan moved. He, he was trying to go against the nation, trying to disturb, you know, cause some problems for the people. But in an attempt to go against the people, what did he do? He influenced the leader. And think about this, this was David. This was a uh, God's man. This was a man who loved God, who honored God, but there is demonic uh, interference. Satan is trying to move upon this leader and moving him to do something that is wrong in the eyes of God so that you know it will affect, eventually affect the people. So keep this in, also in mind. So not only are demons and evil spirits operating in the city, but they're also, you know, trying to work through the leadership in the city or over the nation and trying to cause things to harm and hurt the people, right? So, and we know the ultimate objective is to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's coming to steal, kill, and destroy God's plan for the city, God's plan for the people. Uh, he wants to pervert that so that he works towards uh, in those directions. Now, what I want us to uh, also understand is that uh, uh, one way by which we can understand what is happening in the spiritual dynamics of the city is by looking at certain things that are happening in the natural. So, for instance, if we look at the culture, you look at what's happening in terms of the art, the dance, the festivals, the customs, the superstitions that the people hold on to, things like that. It gives you a little understanding of the spiritual dynamics of the city. You know, you look at something in the natural. You know, uh, sometimes, uh, and, and you can easily tell this, uh, especially in smaller settings. Uh, for example, in a village, you know, which is easier to tell actually. If you go to a village and in, in that village, if they keep, you know, you'll notice in some villages, they may say, you know, everybody in this village is having a certain kind of illness, a certain kind of problem, certain kinds of issues. Now, some sometimes it could be just purely natural. That is, uh, you know, maybe it has to do with the food or you know some other natural thing. It's okay, yeah, some of it maybe just, just because of a certain diet or whatever, they, they're all having common problems. But sometimes you'll also you'll find that it is spiritual. And because of the worship of certain things or certain sacrifices, it is affecting almost every household in that community in that village. So there is a connection. The spiritual is being expressed in the life of the people in a certain way, the influence. And so you can pick it up quite easily when you when you observe that. And so when you look at, I'm just, you know, when you look at culture, when you look at the way things are being expressed in the natural, you get some sense of what is influencing the people. When you also look at the social 
geography of the people? You know, what are the religious groups, ideologies, philosophies, system, religious systems that are pre predominantly in that area, that part of the city? You get an idea, okay, this is what's predominantly influencing people in this area. You look at the moral values, you look at, you know, how people are living their lives. Uh, you look at uh, addictions, you know, is there a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, drug trafficking or prostitution or different things happening in, you know, in that area or in that part of the city, then you know that's a problem, that there's a spiritual influence behind those things. Or sometimes it's human trafficking or bonded labor or suicide, corruption, crime, um, other kinds of needs. You know, you can look at, you know, what are the NGOs struggling with? You know, the social organizations, they are struggling with certain things. And it's okay, so there's a spiritual side to this, right? So by looking at some of the natural aspects, which we have listed here, it gives us some indication what's happening in the spiritual because usually that spiritual dynamic is expressed in the natural through many of these challenges and problems right so you could take some time to think about you know hey in the region where i am what are some of the predominant problems i'm seeing you know expressed either in in the in the in the, in the, in the life of the people and it, it could be you know whether it's moral values or you know, what's happening what are some of the things that i would be able to identify easily right? um, because of the spiritual influencing the natural. Now, uh, uh, I want us to understand that while it is good to observe and, and, and you know, uh, arrive at these, these deductions, uh, don't get too caught up in what is, what, what has, you know, in the past uh, used to be called a spiritual mapping. Now, uh, in the 1980s, especially in 80s, 1980s, 1990s, I think, you know, around that time, there were a lot of uh, books written uh, on spiritual warfare. And, uh, and, you know, this is generally, it is true. We are in spiritual warfare. Uh, we are fighting against uh, principalities and powers rulers of darkness and so on. And that is true. That, that aspect of spiritual warfare is very true. And there were a lot of good books written that told, taught us how to engage in spiritual warfare. Very good. But uh, in that whole uh, spiritual warfare, uh, you know, understanding that was coming to, through to the church, to the body of Christ, there are also certain elements that, uh, are, you know, today, retro, in retrospect, when we look back, we feel like, hey, this was probably impractical. Uh, and unprofitable. And one of them was spiritual mapping, you know, so um, uh, people would go to every part of the city and to uh, identify, you know, religious places and uh, and say, okay, because you have this religious place or that religious place, therefore, you know, this influence is existing uh, in this community. Now, it might work well in certain parts of the world where there's only one religious place in you know, a whole area. But if you come to other parts of the world, you'll find, you know, so many religious places on the road. You know, every road has five or six of these. So what sense are you going to make of it? You know, so it's really impractical. And so if you're going to cover an area, you'll find 50 of those, you know, religious places and all those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, so it was rather impractical. And uh, so I, I would say, you know, while we definitely need to observe and get a general sense don't get caught up in spiritual mapping try to look at uh, looking at every little thing nitty gritty of what's happening on the street because especially in parts of the world that we live and there's a lot happening you know and uh, we will be wasting all our time doing spiritual mapping and we'll never get to do anything you know beyond that so don't don't get caught up in that instead what I, I strongly recommend is to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, just follow the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is able to help us discern. And when he, when he wants us to know certain things, he's going to alert us. As we stay in prayer, as we stay sensitive to him, he's going to alert us. So one, in the natural, we are observant 
that means we are aware of what's happening and we are observant to these things. We're not pretending they're not there. That is what we see in the natural, the news and things you hear. But more importantly, listen to the Holy Spirit to, so that he can tell us, you know, hey, now you have to pray like this or now you have to move like this uh, or you be on guard in this area because the enemy is working actively in this area, you know, protect yourself in this area and so on or put your defenses up in this area. So be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, this whole exercise of uh, understanding the spiritual dynamics, of course, it's going to move, it's going, it's going to help us in how we pray and also how we carry out the ministry in the city. Uh, and now uh, I, I can just, you know, and we all understand the importance of prayer. And we do a course on prayer. You, you've done it in your, I think, your first first year. And we understand how we have to pray for cities, pray for people, pray for nations, pray for regions. And we understand the importance of that. And I, and I just want to, you know, just share this little testimony. Uh, and this goes way back into during my college days. And, 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 I, and I share this because, uh, you know, for us, it was a very small, you know, I, I studied, I did my bachelor's in engineering in Manipal, um, which in those days was a very s small town. It was a student community, basically. There, uh, there were, you know, there was an engineering college, there was a medical college, a dental college, a law college, uh, uh, a big school. Uh, so really, it was predominantly uh, a, a, a student community, an educational center, you know, uh, and it was very, very simple in those days. Of course, things, you know, things have changed a lot. And um, so while I'd gone to study there, uh, do my engineering, my bachelor's in engineering, I knew, I said, God, I know uh, there's a work to be done in this place. Please help me, show me what to do, and so on. So first year we were doing some things you know just having some reaching out to people uh second year we continued you know having some special meetings and trying to reach people let's continue praying and then my third year in engineering college is when we formally launched uh we started uh, what we called as uh, uh, and every week we started meet, every saturday we used to rent a conference hall in a hotel and we started weekly meetings we called it uh uh, believers fellowship meetings, believers fellowship meetings. And so we started just teaching the word. So this was for my third year. Um, and so we started doing that. Now, around the same time, uh, we also started praying. So every Sunday morning, uh, some of us would go uh, uh, towards, uh, so Mani Manipal was kind of like on a hilly, hilly area. So we used to go to one side uh, away from the campus on a hilly area. And we should spend uh, at least two hours, sometimes three to four hours in prayer on Sunday mornings. So we'll go from 6 a.m. We'll, we'll start praying by 6 a.m. on the hillside. And we'll go on through 9, sometimes 10. So mostly we go on through, through till about 10 o'clock. And then we'll get back. So we started praying. We started praying for Manipal. We started interceding and saying, God, now we want to see a move of the Spirit. Now, at that time, when we started doing this, uh, the Believers Fellowship meetings was very small. We would have 20 people, 30 people come, uh, you know. But in the morning, on Sunday mornings, we, people were, go we were going out for prayer. Uh, we would usually have about, uh, you know, six people, six to eight people uh, going for prayer. And we were praying every Sunday. And there would be, you know, we were so committed. We said, rain or sun, whatever, we are going to pray. And there will be times when we were on the hill slope and there would be a heavy downpour because it was on the coast, coastal side of uh, Western India. A heavy rain and heavy rain, we'd be sitting there, but we were praying, and just praying over Manipal, just praying, saying, God, we want to see a move of your Holy Spirit, interceding for the various things that we were aware of spiritually over um, money pal you know so i'm not saying we did like you know a detailed spiritual mapping we did not do that but just generally we knew okay what were the struggles of students 
uh, in Manipal, what was going on. So we were praying. We would pray. We would use the word of God, pray in tongues, uh, pray with the word of God and pray. I uh, spend that time, uh, two to four hours uh, every Sunday. And we continued like that for about a year and a half. Now, by the time I graduated, I left Manipal. Uh, and at that time, the fellowship was still small, maybe 35, 40 people on an average. But I passed on the leadership to the next person who was still going to lead the fellowship. And subsequently, what happened was uh, a year or the following year, there, you know, there was just a mighty move of God in that place. And uh, there was a great, strong work that was started taking place. And that fellowship grew to more than 250 students within, I would say, and I, I, I can't remember the exact things because this was a long time ago. But, you know, within, I think, about two years uh, after, you know, uh, I transitioned, somebody else continued and the work was going. So somewhere two years, three years, whatever, uh, the work just exploded. And uh, students, and I would remember these are all students. So students would come, students would leave, students would come, students would leave. Uh, you know, there was, there, was a, there was a flowing crowd. You know, students would be there for generally four years, five years, maximum five and a half. Um, and that was a co continuous flow of students. But this fellowship grew to about 250 students on an average meeting, and then slowly some families also joined. And when I look back, I can say that the time that was invested in the spiritual, in praying, interceding, you know, praying for money. But now we were all students, you know, we were not like theologians or we didn't have, you know, great uh, ministry experience or anything. Uh, we were just praying. But for the work to suddenly just see a breakthrough and see its huge impact on the lives of so many students, you know, and that work continued for many years. And uh, lots of students from who are now in different parts of the world, many doctors, many, you know, of course, the others are all engineers and lawyers and dentists and so on. Different parts of their lives were impacted through that fellowship. And one part of it, I'm not saying the only, but one part of it, was the prayer that, that went in in that initial time, you know, uh, towards this fellowship. And of course, prayer continued uh, um, in that. So, uh, and for us, looking back, this was a very controlled environment. You know, a city is very big, uh, you know, has millions of people, whereas Manipal was a student community, as a small town. Uh, it is a kind of like a controlled environment for us. Uh, so where we could very, be very focused in our praying, be very simple in our praying, nothing complicated. It was all students, mainly students, praying for the community. Uh, and we could see the results. We could see the outcome in, in, in the lives, in the work of the Spirit that was taking place uh, in that community. So I just want to, what I want to impress is the whole purpose of understanding the spiritual dynamics, the natural and the spiritual dynamics, is to lead us into this kind of action, where one of the things is to pray. Now, of course, we did other things. We had special seminars. We you know, did a lot of outreach work that was happening in Manipal, plus prayer, right? Prayer also was happening, and we saw the fruit. So we are combining the natural dynamics and the spiritual in the work that we are doing uh, in an urban center, okay? Let me pause now before we get into the next uh, closing chapter and I just see if there are any questions. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right, so I see a question there, you know. Uh, so how do we handle religious festivals in within our area, our city, our home city, you know, there are, Hindu festivals and other kinds of, just depending on which part of the world you, sorry, which part of the world you live, um, there will be different kinds of uh, cultural, religious festivals. Now, uh, one is uh, we should never get, uh, uh, you know, don't get, uh, what to say, um, 
uh, don't feel like, oh, uh, it's, this is going to affect the church or it's going to cripple the church or it's going to affect it. Now, don't be in fear. Maybe I should say that. Now, just because there is some religious thing happening, uh, never get in fear. And that's, you know, we know who we are. We are the church. The keys of the kingdom have been given to us and the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, we know that. So, um, uh, you know, we never operate out of fear or, you know, oh, things are going to be bad for us and all of that. No, never operate out of fear, right? Uh, you, we always know who we are and we walk in that sense of authority. Now, people around us may do whatever they would like to do and that's their choice. We are not afraid of it, right? And then, you know, if we just continue to live a life that hosts the presence of God. Um, that means as God's people, as the community of believers, we do what we should do to be a habitation of God's presence, to be a dwelling place of the presence of God. That means we continue in prayer, we continue in worship, and we continue living the life that we have in Christ. That's being the temple of God where we host the presence of God. And when we do that, nothing's going to shake us. Nothing's going to, you know, nothing. So basically, don't operate in the fear. Don't operate out of fear. Secondly, do whatever we normally do to be a dwelling place of God in that community, right? Uh, another question here. When people come off, come and after done the work, when they leave, uh i'm not sure if i understood your question mano like uh, what exactly were you saying when people come uh, and they do their work and they leave meaning uh, i didn't understand actually sir uh, i have one question that when people come church and after their work done and they leave church so what you do that time and they did not come again church um okay somebody has just come to church like a visiting church and then they leave or, or i'm not sure like... actually no actually they come for uh, prayer and mm -hmm. they attending church and mm -hmm. uh, after some days after a few months they went because their work is done and uh, after that they didn't come church so what to do that time? Okay. Oh, I understand what you're saying. That uh, people come to the church because of a certain need. And, uh, you know, they come to church for maybe a couple of months uh, because they have a certain need. Uh, their need is addressed. And then they decide to stop coming to church. Uh, yes. Sir. And that's your question. So what should we do? Well, uh, of course, one is definitely we try to reach out to people, um, you know, even while from the beginning, when they start coming, uh, uh, we try to, you know, uh, reach out to them. We try to disciple them to whatever extent we can uh, try to, uh, you know, put their focus on Jesus. Of course, they have needs. We all have needs, uh, but our focus is on Jesus. So we try to do this, you know, throughout their time uh, when they're coming to the fellowship that, uh, uh, you know, our focus is on Jesus and not just to get our need met and then disappear, but our focus is on growing in a relationship with Jesus uh, and to know him and live for him. So we keep that as a focus. Of course, God is faithful. God is merciful. He will meet needs, but we need to emphasize. So if, if our preaching and if our ministry is need-based, then people's response will also be need-based. Right? If you only keep saying, well, Jesus will heal you and Jesus will deliver you, which is true. Uh, it's not wrong. That is true. But then people will think that, okay, I go to Jesus only when I need healing or when I need deliverance or when I need something. So their relationship with God is also need-based. So when their need is okay, fine. They, they disappear and then until you know they're in, in another, another situation of need. But if our preaching and teaching and our, we are telling them, look, this is relationship. 
with God. We are in a life relationship with God and we are learning how to live out of that relationship. Then it's not a need-based thing. It is, I am so, uh, walking with Jesus because I want to grow in relationship with him and let that relationship affect my life. And of course, in the process, I have needs. I will present my needs to the Lord and he will minister to me and so on. So then what happens? People understand. Even when my needs are met and everything is fine, I'm still growing in relationship. So that will you know, ensure that they continue uh, to grow spiritually and be a part of the community of believers. Okay. So. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. So now let's just go to the last section in this introduction as we uh, learn about urban church planting, which is just to quickly look at some uh, some uh, you know lessons from uh, uh, the book of Acts. All right, and I will just uh, say you know share some of these things very quickly. Uh, you know we could take a lot of time to read and examine each of these, but um, I will just highlight. Right? Some of these things. So we know in Acts chapter 1, this was right after the resurrection of Jesus, Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus gives his apostles and the early believers, um, the account here in Acts 1 tells us that about 120 of them, uh, he says, look, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So that's that's the vision. That's the mission. Right. This is going to start in Jerusalem, but it's going to go to the ends of the earth. Right. And you can imagine these twelve, I mean, the eleven apostles and the other twelfth one added, and there were 120 people, and you know, Jesus is telling them, From here, it's going to go to the ends of the earth. And they're they're probably like, you know, we're just a small group. How is it going to happen? But then I accept two. The day of Pentecost takes place. Holy Spirit is poured out. And we see how the church in Jerusalem, you know, when you look at Acts 2 all the way through Acts 8, uh, it covers the, an eight-year period approximately. And then in that eight years, from Acts 2 to Acts 8, uh, we see how the church in Jerusalem just exploded. Right? And if, you, if we were to say, okay, what were the main things that helped in the growth of this church in such a powerful way? We can highlight a lot of things. You know, we could say, well, there was strong teaching the apostles. Uh, you know, they were discipling the believers in whatever they learned. We see this in Acts 2. There was constant fellowship. They were meeting from house to house. There was prayer and worship. They were engaging in prayer and worship. Um, there, were, there was a demonstration of God's power and healings, miracles, signs and wonders. Um, and uh, there was uh, a community. So the people were sharing with each other the things they had. And uh, um, there was also resolution of problems. So when there was a problem between the uh, the Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew-speaking Jews, you know, they resolved the problem. And so they maintained that unity. Uh, there was a great sense of reverence for God, the Bible tells us. So we could highlight these things, you know, and say, wow, this was, a, here was a church. These are the characteristics. And this church in Jerusalem was powerful. It was impacting the city of Jerusalem, you know. So this church, was really impacting the city. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about cities. We're talking about impacting cities. And definitely the church in Jerusalem was such a church. It was impacting the city. But what I want to highlight very importantly is that in this eight-year period, the these believers, thousands of them, were so equipped in God, were so strong in God that when a big wave of persecution came, which dispersed the community. So all of a sudden, you know, thousands of people were displaced because of persecution. So the church in Jerusalem may have been about 20,000 people. Uh, that's a rough estimate, what people say, that in eight years it grew to about 20,000, just as an estimate. But when there was persecution, thousands of people were scattered. 
they had to leave Jerusalem. So many of them would have gone back to their own hometowns where they came from. Uh, many of them went into all the neighboring towns and villages around Jerusalem, and they all went up all the way north, uh, up into Syria in Antioch. Uh, some of them went over, you know, various places. Uh, so the church in Jerusalem was scattered, but did, it didn't cause the church to die. Overnight, the church multiplied. So when these believers were dispersed, it only resulted in the multiplication of the church. Why? Because the believers were so strong. So wherever these believers went, they reproduced the church. So example is in Acts 8, uh, Philip goes to Samaria and he preaches Christ there and a church is established there. Who was Philip? He was a helper in the Jerusalem church. But when he even he was scattered, that means when he had to leave because of the persecution, when he went to Samaria, he just preached Jesus and a church was established. And so, you know, you read about in Acts 11, that some of the believers who were, who were scattered in Acts uh, 8, when they went up uh, all the way to Antioch, the city of Antioch in Syria, north of Jerusalem, way north in Jerusalem, they planted a church there. And so everywhere churches were planted. So that's what we can say about the initial church in Jerusalem. It was so powerful. When it was persecuted, it just multiplied. Then we see later on, we see the uh, transformation of uh, Saul. And then from Acts 13 onwards, we see Saul's ministry, you know, how he went and ministered in cities. So we can quickly go through some of the examples. Uh, in Acts 13, we see how when Paul came uh, to Paphos, uh, uh, the city of Paphos, there there is a governor. He's a very intelligent, intelligent man, but uh, he is also a very spiritual man. He is very interested in spiritual things, but. Paul demonstrates the power of God. And uh, uh, this man, Sergius Paulus, in Acts 13, a very intelligent man, he turns to Jesus Christ when he sees the power of God and he hears the teaching about Jesus. So we see that uh, there was a spiritual encounter which caused the leader to change. And obviously when the leader changes, you know, there could be many others who... Uh, would follow uh, his choice. And they say, wow, you know, a leader is making a choice, so uh, maybe we should also follow. We don't have too much of a record in that, but we have a record of how the leader of, uh, how Sergius Paulus was affected. In Acts 17, we see Paul journeying through Thessalonica, through Berea, uh, through to Athens. When he comes to Athens, you know, how he uh, preaches the gospel in Athens. So Athens is a very interesting case study because uh, it was an intellectual city. So it's nice to observe, you know, Paul took time to survey Athens uh, to understand what was going on in that city. And then he presented Christ uh, to the intellectuals of that city and a church was planted. Uh, in Acts 18, he comes to Corinth Corinth is a very sinful city, quite different from Athens. Uh, and we see how Paul, uh, along with the Aquila and Priscilla, uh, they stay in Corinth for quite an extended time, for about a year and a half. Uh, and they are working, they're making tents, but they're also establishing a church there. We don't have too much details about uh, everything that happened, but we know a strong church was established. Now, then he comes to Ephesus. Uh, and you read about this in Acts 18 and Acts 19. And Ephesus is a different kind of a city. In Ephesus, uh, the goddess Diana is being worshipped. Uh, and it's a very spiritual city, right? So Athens, a very intellectual city. Corinth, a very sinful city. Ephesus, a very spiritual city. They're all worshippers of the goddess Diana. And... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, but 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 in that city, the power of God is so demonstrated, 
uh, that um, people turn from their witchcraft, they turn from their, you know, all the black magic, they, you know, they bring everything and burn it to the point where the people who are worshiping goddess Diana get upset because their business goes down. People are turning away from, you know, buying merchandise, uh, the idols of goddess Diana. Now they've stopped buying it uh, and they're following Jesus. So, you know, you see the dynamics over there. So just some examples, you know, if you look at this and we could even look at Acts 16 and Philippi, I've not listed here, but how God, how Paul goes into Philippi and there it's again, there is a spiritual encounter there that affects the whole city. So if you look at how, what happened in Philippi, you look at what happened in, in uh, 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 Athens, you look at what happened in Corinth, you, know, you look at what happened in Ephesus, you know, these are, you know, you can you can just pick up a few insights here of how these people ministered in the cities of their day when they went, you know, and, and each city was different, like we mentioned. Uh, they were very spiritual cities, they were very intellectual cities, they were very sinful cities, different, different cities. Um, and, 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 and they served, they ministered, and they established churches, uh, which became strong churches, to which Paul later on, you know, he writes many of his epistles to these churches that had been uh, established. All right. So uh, Paul, as he journeys, he goes to some of these major cities. So, you know, just to bring this to a close, uh, it is estimated that Paul, uh, through his through three missionary journeys, touched at least 50 major cities of his time. So he definitely would have stopped in numerous villages, uh, our communities, which, you know, are probably not even recorded for us. But it is estimated that he affected 50 major cities all the way to Rome. So, you know, when you read, go on later on in, in Acts, Paul, uh, is sent to Rome and he spends at least two years in Rome. And although he is under house arrest, imprisoned in Rome, yet his influence reaches all the way to um, Caesar because the guards who come, Paul witnesses to them, Paul shares the gospel with them and they are taking the message back into the palace while Paul is waiting for his turn to be tried. The message has already gone in to the palace through the Roman soldiers. So everywhere, Paul is reaching, influencing cities. And about 50 cities in his day, he influenced uh, just by physically going there, traveling on road or traveling through ship, and he impacts the city. So the point I just want to bear across in our hearts is in the book of Acts, we see urban missions being played out for us. Now, we don't have all the details uh, other than, you know, what is given to us. And we can pick up a few things here and there. But the fact is cities or missions to city was an important, important part in fulfilling Acts 1.8, Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Cities was an important part of that. I'm not saying it was the only part, but it was an important part of that. And so today, um, even in our day and time, cities are very important, probably more important because people are moving into the cities. So, you know, with this, we've kind of given a little bit of introduction to uh, urban church planting or planting uh, studying churches and ministries in cities. As we go into the next section, we start talking about the natural dynamics. We start getting into, okay, you know, here's how we start doing things, just the practical things. Um, the goal is just to share with you, you know, some of the lessons we have learned, um, uh, both, you know, while we worked in Bangalore and in other places, uh, starting churches or starting ministry works. Um, what are some practical things we need to keep in mind? You know, uh, now we're going to talk about 
ground level, you know, when you're down in the trenches, you're you're starting to dig, you're starting to lay the foundation. What are some of the things to keep in mind? How to go about it? How you know some things to think about? I'm not saying that everything we are going to learn you will have to use every time. No, these are just ideas. These are just some practical lessons, and in different situations you may use some of them, uh, and uh, it will be helpful as you think about either starting a church or a ministry in urban center. Okay, so any questions before we close for today? Any, any things you want to ask so far? All right, um, I don't see any questions. So we're gonna close in prayer and then uh, we will you know, get into the section two uh, the natural dynamics uh, next week and get into all the details, okay? So I want to just ask somebody to please uh, close us in prayer and dismiss the class. Could anyone, anyone could pray and uh, close, please? Right, who wants to do it? Aaron, want to pray? Yeah, Pastor, sure. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, letting us understand each day as we are soaking in your word. Lord, thank you for letting us understand about a spiritual dynamic of urban center. Lord, in your word says that uh, to put the whole armor so that, Lord, uh, we can stand against evil works. So, Lord, help us to be more sensitive in spirit and help us to progress, to walk by faith, not by sight. And, Lord, let us all hold into our calling and give the heart of zeal who will say yes and I will go, Lord. So, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for, for everyone to attend this class. And, Lord, thank you, especially, Lord, Father, we just want to say thank you for Pastor Ashish, Lord, Father, for using him uh, uh, as a channel of, of blessing, Lord. So, Lord, Lord, I, uh, we just want to say thank you, Lord, and thank you for being with us throughout this day, Lord. So I submit all the students. Uh, into your loving hand in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, um, Thank you see you again. Thank you, sir. Uh,